Hey guys, this is Kevin Budashevsky, and this is Heart Murmurs. So let's start with the murmur I hear weekly, if not daily, on the wards, aortic stenosis. The problem in aortic stenosis is a calcification and stiffening of these valve leaflets, either due to old age or from excessive wear and tear, like you would see in a bicuspid aortic valve. So pathology question, would this be malignant or dystrophic calcification? Right, it would be dystrophic. It's calcification of damaged tissue. As you can see here in this image, this valve is supposed to be open, but the valve leaflets are calcified closed. So it takes a while for sufficient enough pressure to build up in the aorta to open that valve. And this is where the TARDIS or late component comes from. These people have late pulses. So how does the left ventricle respond to having to pump harder against a stenotic valve? Well, like you've seen in other of my videos, it's going to hypertrophy. So what do you think will happen to the stroke volume if you're pumping through a stenotic valve? Right, it's going to decrease. On physical exam, this will also result in a weak pulse. This can be a problem because, one, we're not going to have enough blood volume in the aorta for adequate systemic and coronary perfusion. This decreased forward systemic perfusion can actually result in syncope because not enough blood is being delivered to the brain. In addition, the poor ejection will result in less blood in the aorta to perfuse the coronary arteries and diastole, and this can actually predispose to ischemia, which your patient can feel as angina. So one symptom that's always confused me with aortic stenosis is dyspnea. Can you guys think of why patients might get dyspnea with AS? So the dyspnea can be attributed to the hypertrophy of the left ventricle. Over time, the left ventricle increases its wall thickness and becomes poorly compliant, leaving the heart in a state of diastolic dysfunction. Then when the patient moves around, their heart cannot accommodate more blood in the chamber despite increased systemic and cardiac requirements. As a result of this, the aortic chemoreceptors and send signals to the brainstem creating the sensation of shortness of breath. So before we listen to the murmur, when in the cardiac cycle would you expect to hear this, and in what area would it be the loudest? Right, so blood is being ejected from the aorta during systole. So this would be a systolic murmur loudest at the aortic space, aka the right second intercostal space. Because it's systolic, it occurs after S1 and lasts all of systole, hence the term holosystolic. And the crescendo part is due to continued increase in left ventricular pressure and flow across the stenotic aortic valve until you get to maximum contractility here. And then as the ventricle starts to relax, the murmur will decrease in intensity because there will be a decrease in flow. And that's what results in the decrescendo. Additionally, turbulent flow can be heard radiating to the carotids because the aortic valve pushes obviously right up into the aortic arch, and then you're going to have immediately thereafter the right brachiocephalic, which turns into the right common carotid, as well as the left common carotid. All right, so let's take a listen to this. This murmur is extremely unique because it increases and then starts to decrease in intensity, aka the crescendo-decrescendo that we just talked about. It's worth noting that the worse aortic stenosis gets, the later the murmur will be in systole. This should make intuitive sense as a more profound aortic stenosis will require more ventricular contraction and pressure in order to eject blood. Moving on, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation are grouped together because they're essentially the same thing except on different sides of the heart. So you can have regurgitation over a prolapsing mitral valve after a myocardial infarction or due to left ventricular dilation pulling the valves apart. Additionally, it can be due to infective endocarditis or rheumatic heart disease. In MVP, the valve leaflets prolapse enough so that blood can regurgitate, so that one should be pretty darn simple. In the post-infarction period, one of the papillary muscles can rupture, resulting in sudden onset regurgitation. So do you guys remember which papillary muscle is most likely to infarct? Well, it's the one that has only one blood supply, which is the posterior medial papillary muscle. Additionally, rheumatic fever can target any of the heart valves because it's an autoimmune cross-reaction against glycosaminoglycans that are a component of all heart valves. And finally, infective endocarditis will usually be presented to you in a vignette about an IV drug user with tricuspid regurgitation. So why tricuspid and not mitral regurgitation? Well, when an IV drug user punctures their skin with a needle, it obviously goes into their veins, and those bacteria that go into their veins, the first thing those bacteria are going to be seeing is the right atrium, because that's where the venous return goes into. And so, of course, the first valve thereafter is the tricuspid valve. So just because it's the most common does not mean that you cannot have other valves involved. 
So where are we going to hear these murmurs and what do they sound like? Both of these murmurs occur throughout systole. Again, this is something that should make intuitive sense rather than something you have to memorize. So as the ventricles contract in systole by definition, so if we're going to have blood regurging from the ventricles into the atria, you would expect this during the high ventricular pressures during systolic contraction. Mitral regurgitation is heard best where the sound travels fastest, where the greatest mass is within the left ventricle, which is at the cardiac apex. Now, what about radiating to the axillate part? Well, it depends on where the vector of blood flow is. And so we have blood going from the left ventricle into the left atrium. And additionally, in tricuspid regurgitation, we have blood going from the right ventricle, which is the anterior portion of the heart, to the right atrium. So speaking of tricuspid regurgitation, it's a murmur that's heard best where, again, most mass of the right ventricle is located, which is directly under the sternum around rib 5. As we discussed in anatomy, what chamber of the heart is most anterior? Good, that would be the right ventricle. And just like with mitral regurgitation, it's the regurgitant flow vector that determines where you can hear the murmur. All right, so let's take a listen. Okay, next up is mitral valve prolapse. The problem in MVP is that there's redundant tissue in the mitral valve so that some of it prolapses back into the left atrium. And you can see that here. Note that instead of flat valves, we have valves that parachute back into the LA, so that rather than a tight seal like a Ziploc bag, we have a floppy and a loose seal that can allow for regurgitation of blood. So what would be a major lifestyle change that could help with this? Well, it was kind of a poorly worded question, but what I was getting at was you don't want to be dehydrated with this. You want to stay hydrated. And the reason for that is that if you're hydrating and you have more intravascular volume, it's going to push out and kind of balloon out the chambers of the heart. So if we balloon out the left ventricle, it's going to push these valves further away from each other, which will kind of flatten out these valves. As a result of this, they'll more closely approximate each other, decreasing the amount of regurgitation. Now when the valve leaflets prolapse, the cordae that are holding them in place tighten extremely quickly. This tension creates a vibration like flickering of a guitar string, and we hear this as the audible click that's characteristic of mitral valve prolapse, and it's often described as a mid-systolic click. So let's look at the phonogram and then listen to the murmur. So here's your mid-systolic click, we just talked about that, and then after this we can get some regurgitation and some turbulent flow that results in a murmur that ends at S2. Of course, since this is mitral valve prolapse, it's going to be loudest in the mitral area. So let's take a listen to it. And since that was short, we can do it one more time. So mitral valve prolapse is actually really common, and it's often benign. In fact, in most cases, it's benign. A lot of people, especially women, live with it their entire lives without actually knowing that they have it. One etiology is myxomatous degeneration, which means that there are way too many mucopolysaccharides on the valves that can cause excess water retention, and this makes the valve tissue redundant as well as floppy and weak. Because floppy valves are more easily damaged, and damaged things in the body are more likely to get infected, this can result in subacute endocarditis. Remember that low virulence hasic organisms love damaged valves. Alright, moving on, this is ventricular septal defects. A VSD is a defect that allows blood to flow from the left ventricle, which is higher pressure, back into the right ventricle. This murmur is best heard at the tricuspid area, because the right ventricle is closest to the chest wall on auscultation. This is a holosystolic murmur because the ventricles contract throughout the duration of systole by definition. Alright, let's take a listen to it. And one more. Anytime you hear a holosystolic murmur in the tricuspid area, you need to be concerned about either a VSD or tricuspid regurgitation. And so how are you going to differentiate? Well, one thing you can do is that the murmur of a VSD does not radiate up to the axilla like the murmur of tricuspid regurgitation. Alright guys, now that we've covered ventricular septal defects, we're going to cover diastolic murmurs. So what are the two most common diastolic murmurs that you guys need to know about? Well, that would be aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis. The arrow here on the left shows regurgitation of blood through the aortic valve. The combination of regurgitated blood and new blood coming in will eventually overwhelm the left ventricle and progress to systolic dysfunction and then heart failure. So why would somebody develop aortic regurgitation? 
Well, it can be due to a number of causes. So wear and tear, in the case of a bicuspid aortic valve, could cause it. You could also have endothelial surface damage due to infective endocarditis, or by autoimmune antibody assault in the case of rheumatic fever. Additionally, you can imagine that an ascending aortic aneurysm would pull apart the aortic valve, leading to regurgitation. And just as a reminder, what type of aortic dissection dissects towards the heart? Right, type A for ascending aorta or awful, whichever way you want to remember it. So let's take a listen. And we'll do that one more time. You can hear how this is a high-pitched blowing murmur that starts at the onset of S2, hence diastolic, because that's exactly when the aortic valve closes and when the diastolic pressure in the aortic valve is the highest. As you can see in this phonogram, the intensity is highest at the onset of diastole and it decreases thereafter. We're going to hear this best along the left sternal border near the third intercostal space. And the reason it's not going to be in the aortic area is because the blood flow vector of regurgitating blood is directed away from it. Alright, moving on, this is mitral stenosis. The classic cause of mitral stenosis is rheumatic fever. So this is a great time for us to focus and review the pathogenesis and immunology behind this disease. So if you have pharyngitis from group A strep, aka strep pyogenes, your immune system will produce tons of antibodies to bacterial antigens such as M-protein that cross-react and deposit on valves. The deposition of cross-reactive antibodies causes inflammation leading to fibrosis and thickening of valve leaflets. And this can get so bad that you even have the edges of the valves that start to fuse together. So this is an example of what immunologic phenomenon? Good, molecular mimicry, and that's what type of hypersensitivity reaction? Good, type 2. So let's visualize this quickly. Here's a diagram showing the normal mitral valve with anterior and posterior leaflets. The commissures, or where the valve leaflets come together, insert on the annulus or fibrous ring that serves as the base of the valve. Above, we see how these two leaflets open easily. As the recurrent inflammation and fibrosis thickens the valve, these commissures fuse and we're left with a slit-like opening like we see here. And this results in the valves not opening as easily. Alright, so let's take a look at the phonogram. Blood flowing over this valve creates a characteristic diastolic rumble that occurs after an opening snap. The snap comes from where the valve leaflets bulge like a dome until enough pressure snaps the mobile parts of the leaflets open. As the stenosis gets worse and worse, you start to hear it sooner and sooner. This is not a good sign, so the closer you hear it to S2, the more severe the stenosis. So where are we going to hear this murmur? Well, remember that the largest mass of the left ventricle is at the cardiac apex, and so that's the best area for auscultation. So let's take a listen to it. So why is chronic mitral stenosis a bad thing for our left atrium? Well, the left atrium is pushing against a higher afterload due to the stenotic valve, and so that's going to increase left atrial pressures and eventually cause the left atrium to balloon out. This results in the most common presenting symptom of mitral stenosis, which is dyspnea. So as those left atrial pressures get higher, fluid backs up into the lungs and results in dyspnea. So what structure or structures can be compressed by an excessively dilated left atrium? Well, one of them is the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. This is super high yield for you to remember. Additionally, the left atrium sits right in front of the esophagus. This is why cardiologists can do transesophageal echocardiograms when they want to take a look at the heart by putting a probe into the esophagus. Because of this, a dilated left atrium secondary to rheumatic fever or any other cause can cause dysphagia as well. Finally, the left main stem bronchus sits over the left atrium, and so you can see elevation of the left main stem bronchus on chest x-ray. All right, moving on, this is patent ductus arteriosus. So we've discussed murmurs that are heard in systole and murmurs that are heard in diastole, and now we're going to discuss a murmur that you can hear in both. So what are two common reasons for a kid to have a patent ductus? Well, the two most common causes are prematurity and congenital rubella. So kids need time for smooth muscle cell proliferation and fibrosis to obliterate the ductus and just leave the remnant, which is the ligamentum arteriosum. If you're born early enough, you don't have time to do this. So why is the murmur systolic and diastolic? Well, that's because there's always a gradient. So think about the pressures in the aorta versus the pressures in the lungs. So if this is connecting the aorta to the lungs, and the aortic pressure is, say, 120, and the pressure in the lungs might just be 20 systolically. 
And so there's always going to be a higher pressure in the aorta, and since this is essentially an open tube, you're always going to have a pressure gradient, and therefore you're always going to have a murmur. Note how the sound gets loudest when the systolic pressure in the aorta should be the highest. So where do we place the stethoscope to hear this murmur? Well, you're going to hear it at the ductus, which is directly under the left clavicle. And finally, what are we going to hear when we place our stethoscope there? Well, let's take a listen. And we'll do that one more time. So this very characteristic murmur lasts throughout systole and diastole, and a lot of times will be described as a machine-like murmur or a continuous murmur. All right, time for a flash quiz regarding auscultation of the heart and what areas are the murmurs of pulmonic stenosis and pulmonic regurgitation best heard. Well, that would be the pulmonic area and the left sternal border. This is an interesting answer because we're talking about the same valve, but the locations of the two murmurs are heard in different areas. Again, this has to do with flow vectors. So in pulmonic stenosis, there's a systolic murmur, and in pulmonic regurgitation, we have a diastolic murmur. In pulmonic stenosis, the right ventricle is forcing blood over a tiny diameter up and towards the left second intercostal space. In pulmonic regurgitation, blood is flowing backwards from the pulmonary artery and back into the right ventricle.